Greetings everyone and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV. Here we're discussing the topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly, his appeal and life situations. We're going to talk about the Universal Messaging Oracle program, belief in self card set number se or card number 7 of the belief in self suit, which is the third suit in the Oracle program. I hope everyone is doing great today. Um, I do have some updated information about the appeal processing um, in New York, as well as the Chicago um, motions that have been filed. Not too many things are out there. However, there are some movement, very small, minute movement, but that movement is good movement, right? <laughs> So, like I said, we're going to be listening to the conversation this evening on how card number seven ties into our conversation. So we know that the 21st of December has come and gone. The winter solstice, my birthday, um, moving into, you know, that major area where the you know, the universe is at its midpoint alignment, but we haven't heard anything. Nothing too important on the docket as of right now. We're supposed to have some type of prosecutorial post-trial motion hearing um, um, information, some statements on the recommendations from the um, prosecution of timeline, how much time um, should be looked at, you know, with Robert Sylvester Kelly, with his sentencing coming up in February of 23. So that is kind of a good thing for Robert because of the fact if there's nothing there, they've been, they've continued. But to continue during a process of sentencing means he sits a little bit longer. That I have a problem with. But on the flip side, I know that things are being negotiated legally right now. In my opinion, I feel that they are rethinking this information from the request of Jennifer Bonjean and Ashley Cohen when it came to the request of either an acquittal or a new trial for Chicago. So that's, that's simply amazing. And as if they were just allowing everyone, it seems to me like what happened, they were allowing everyone to just say whatever they wanted to say in order to get things off their chest, put it out there to mainstream media, letting the entire world know that this is what has been taking place. This is what is being said about Robert Sylvester Kelly, not knowing if it was true or not but just putting it out there, putting out the docuseries, putting out the Lifetime documentary um, that is going to still be the fina uh, grand finale of it all. So it's there for us to consider. And, you know, as I was doing the Marvin Gaye um, video, uh, I had a friend who you know, she told me that as a survivor of sexual assault, um, as a young child herself, it was very traumatic to hear anything relative to um, sexual exploitation of a child. And I get that. I get that. But I do believe that in Robert Sylvester Kelly's case, I'm not even saying in Marvin Gaye's case. I'm just saying that, you know, in Robert Sylvester Kelly's case, there is so much being done here with the fact that he has not made any official statement of him being, you know, doing these acts or not. OK, he's always been quiet. So so as a survivor of sexual assault as a young girl, my friend she realizes, and she told me this, she said, I realized that no matter how flat the pancake is, there are always two sides to every story. We're not going to become um, in disagreement with each other because you believe one way and I believe one way because experiences teach us a lot. And I know for me, experience teaches that we can be disrespected in the system of the court of law 
and you know people can manipulate and maneuver testimonies and especially if giving if being given you know reciprocity to just say this and get that you know um so as i listen to her and her story and how she felt about robert i still felt that her situation with empathy may not be the same they're very quite different from the ones that we're discussing in Robert Sylvester Kelly's case. No one knows, but those who are involved in the area where the situation occurred. And that's one thing that I will hold on to um, with the love of my friend. And I will say that um, no one knows, but those who were involved in that room on those evenings or who were in the studio on those days that again is not for me to judge. I'm not here to judge or be a juror. I'm here as an observer to the timeline, which tonight we're going to discuss and refresh the memory of Kelly Nation about the timeline. But before we do that, um, I want to talk about the REM or rapid eye movement state in the sleep realm. Okay, remember we talked about uh, card number six. And we talked about how the eye of consciousness can create for us our storyline, what we bring back to the physical existence of our, our thoughts within our deep realms of sleep. So the REM, the REM cycle or rapid eye movement cycle, according to the Institute of Sleep, says that rapid eye movement is a stage of sleep that is associated with our dream state and our memory consolidation. So it's a, a, co a compilation of thoughts and ideas that we have sitting at the door, the threshold of our psychological thought. And so if we think that, yeah, okay, we're a good person. We think that, you know, we're going to have a good night sleep. We're going to be you know, up and ready to move in a successful way tomorrow morning or whenever we awaken. When we have these, these, these good positive thoughts about us, we bring them into the REM, the REM state. And that is our consciousness. That's why when we go to sleep, we're told, don't go to sleep angry at your mate. Or after watching a, a scary movie, don't fall asleep. Or... Don't fall asleep after you've eaten a full course meal, you know, give it time to digest and because all that is at the threshold of our conscious state. And then we bring that into the deepness of what we do in our non-rapid movement state. So in this case, I would be, I would look at where Robert Sylvester Kelly would set the tone of what he brought back to the physical area of his life from his awareness of rapid eye movement sleep state. So in this rapid eye movement sleep state of Robert, um, constantly selling out tours, constantly, you know, uh, being the center of attention in so many different areas as a superstar, Robert Sylvester Kelly kept the superstar status at the threshold of his consciousness when he fell asleep. That's what made him continually create music. Cause deep down into his non rapid eye movement, I bet you those are, that is where his significant points of music and things that he can, you know, master mind to make top superstar songs with individuals and himself. That's where all the gifts lay. And they lay there waiting for him, dormant. They're sitting there waiting for him to just manipulate and mastermind, you know, what new song he's going to produce next. And so, and then sex was also on his subconscious mind. So in the concept of um, sexuality, his subconscious thoughts probably always drove him to that focus, to that area of thinking. And what we do in our subconscious state um, goes into the realm of our unconscious state. So to make sure 
that um, our conscious is clear before going to sleep into the subcon into the subconscious world. The REM sleep is what we do before we go deeper. Okay. So in 1950, when scientists studied sleeping infants in this study, they watched their eyes would move from side to side in their sleep state. And as they went deeper into the non-rapid eye movement state or the more subconscious state, they realized that there was not too much movement. And um, it made the babies more quieter. Their breathing was more repetitive and more relaxed and more, um, how can I put it, a, a, of a pattern. And it was like a rhythm. It was like its own personal music. And that's what we have to do to get our brain activity and our heart rate and our body temperature to slow down. Our muscles then relax in the non-rapid eye movement area where we can start to then go out into astral projection or we can move into the areas of um, just that state of peace and tranquility. This is where the subconscious realm takes over. So when we awaken, we bring certain thoughts back to life with us while we are subconsciously in a non-activity state. Now this is said to be processing the manifestation or the very dreams that we bring into our physical being as connected to whatever we last thought about. So imagine people bringing fear into their own lives because of the non-rapid eye movement subconscious deep level sleep state. We can bring that in. And a lot of times um, people say that the portal to the soul is ignited by our cell phones, our uh, laptops, our TVs. You know, we open portals to our soul. So when we go into the realm of sleep consciousness, unconsciousness, and that sleep state of non-rapid eye movement, what's happening is we are going out there. We're going out into the, we're astral projecting out there. And then that brings along a certain amount of, you know, mental whatever. That's why Robert was able to be so creative in the music industry because he was so out there. He was using this concept very, very, at a very young age. So... This is why every part of Robert's life, in my opinion, was created and lived out through his conscious or subconscious processing. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> because I feel that REM is really memory. It's memory glitches. You know, our minds do a lot of work over the course of birth till death. And we just leave little remnants of regularity of things that, you know, we find important because that's what we do. We find things important. So it's a memory, it's a memory cycle during rest. Our bodies remind us of what we have done, what we are thinking, what we are feeling. And it's kind of like a uh, conscious journal. You know, every dream that we have our conscious remembers it. And that's what's really ser seriously crazy to me. You know, um, it helps us in internal uh, future goal setting. You know, like I was saying, you know, if you want to be a teacher, you know, you got to start that processing. The first thing you got to do is feel as though you are a teacher. Say to yourself, I am a teacher. And not just to go out there and just fake being a teacher, but no, you walk the path and being a teacher in a successful way and however you want to do it. And then you become that. So these are, um, so the REM state also allows one to sleep with the, with the choice. We have a choice to go out there because we take our minds where we want it to be. 
It grounds us and it gives us balance and it brings that energy back to us. You know how sometimes people can say, well, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You're just so mean today. Why are you so mean? What happened? Because in your REM state, your subconscious held at the threshold whatever you were still thinking about before you fell asleep, you know. And so, so rituals are highly important when we are getting ready to go to bed for whatever, you know, um, for whatever we're thinking about at that time. Rituals are very extreme. Um, Christians use prayer and medit and Buddhists use meditation. Um, other religions or spirituality forms use uh, crystals. They use um, mantras, they use santras. And so the practicing of creative work helps with the psyche, helps it to inform our memory that we should raise awareness that we are going wherever we're choosing to go. You know, sometimes people can say that they've, um, they've fallen off of a cliff in a dream and that re reflects that when they wake up, they are hyperventilating because truthfully what the subconscious feels is what it is. So when you bring it back to this physical realm, guess what? It raises the awareness of the physicalness to relate to what the consciousness is doing. It's just really amazing how the mind and the brain and everything functions so perfectly, you know? Um, and then it helps us plan our future. You know, and if we constantly hear, that's what I said, like in one of the, one of the segments or podcasts I did about three or four days or three or four videos ago, I said, Robert Sylvester Kelly had seeds planted in his mind about all these negative things that he had done. And even though he ignored it and he was strong in mental health and physical being and he kept making his music deep inside those seeds were planted and they stayed planted until he consciously purposely subconsciously put that in his state of being to where he's at today you know so it's about being rested it's about knowing what the mind is capable of doing you know, and and what we have created to live through in this subconscious or conscious realm, you know, and that's what I wanted to share with you on the REM state. Now, we'll be going over uh, card set number eight, um, and it's going to get a little bit deeper um, in the con concept of the consciousness. So, as I promised you tonight, I would like to introduce you to this one um, video here and it came out let me see this was let me see here was it this one let me see So, yeah, this is about the timeline of Robert Sylvester Kelly and what was actually done. Um, it was five months ago by Fox 10, Phoenix. Let's listen to this. Really, at every step of the way, right here, later that summer. Now let's go to 1992. R. Kelly and public announcement debuted Born into the 90s. Released a year later, the album went platinum. Now let's go to 93. His album 12 Play is released and eventually sells more than 5 million copies. His single inc includes Sex Me and Bump and Grind, which become the longest running number one R&B song in more than 30 years. Now we go to 1994. At the age of 27, R. Kelly marries a 15-year-old R&B singer named Aaliyah. 
the couple weds in a secret ceremony arranged by Kelly at a hotel in Chicago. The marriage is annulled months later because of Aaliyah's age. Now we go to September of that year. Aaliyah's debut album, Age Ain't Nothing But a Number, which Kelly produced, is certified platinum. Aaliyah... Not only did R. Kelly produce that, but Barry Hankerson wrote it. Um, so... These, this is the timeline that I want you to pay attention to. And I want you to listen to how it's all going down because it sounds to me as though it's a dream in somebody's world. It's like, this is a dream, a simple fantasy. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Tragically dies in a plane crash seven years later, just at the young age of 22. Now let's go to 1996. R. Kelly releases his third album titled R. Kelly. A month later, he incorporates Rockland Records. His song, I Believe I Can Fly, we all remember from the Space Jam soundtrack, peaks at number two on the Billboard pop chart. That same year, he marries a 22-year-old Andrea Lee, a dancer from his touring group. The couple goes on to have three children. Now let's go to 1997. Tiffany Hawkins filed a complaint against R. Kelly alleging intentional sexual battery and sexual harassment while she was a minor. In 1998, Hawkins' lawsuit is reportedly settled for $250,000. Later in 98, Kelly won three Grammys for I Believe I Can Fly. And later in the year, his album R hit stores. It goes on to sell six million copies. Now listen to that. Listen to those numbers. Listen to the the way that he's breaking this timeline down. That is so not a everyday person's world. This is a, you know, I was looking at a Whitney Houston video the other day and she won eight Grammys in one night. She ran up and down that, you know, stage thanking everybody eight different um, uh, Grammys or awards. And it makes you think people in the position of Hollywood want to make us feel as though these people are so, they put Whitney on a big pedestal like that from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, introducing her to, you know, Kevin Costner, connecting to her everybody who was somebody was near and around the energy of Whitney Houston in this in this uh award program but it was only to bring her to a level where everyone in the world knew her so when she fell we would know that she fell crazy it's crazy how the concept of, and then um, I was listening to a video of her voice and somebody made mention in the in the in the um, comment section her vo she seems unreal and sometimes it makes you wonder if these superstars are truly fictitious is R. Kelly fictitious is he so not Robert Sylvester Kelly that it is amazing how R. Kelly was able to live this type of lifestyle and do these type of things for the sake of the name R. Kelly. But then Robert Sylvester Kelly is the human behind the superstar who may be unreal. You see, I mean, and these are things that just boggles my mind, but let's get back to this. It's about maybe three more minutes. In August of 2001, we find that Tracy Sampson files a lawsuit against Kelly, alleging their sex was illegal under Illinois law because he was in a position of authority over her. The case was reportedly settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Now we go to 2002, where the Chicago Sun-Times reported that it received a videotape alleging showing that R. Kelly having sex with a minor. The paper reported Chicago police began investigating allegations about R. Kelly and the same girl three years earlier. At the time... The now, here's the thing about that. Whenever our sleep state awakens into a conscious situation... We could also be bringing into the conscious areas what others have reported. 
you see, and that plants the seed and makes it real. And then we have to do whatever we need to do in order to wake up from that nightmare. That's where he's at. Robert Sylvester Kelly is in that, that, uh, uh, uncon or subconscious or unconscious sleep state that he's still there. He's still out there, you know, and, and being out there, this is what's taking place on the physical plane for him. You know, when his, when his mind is no longer present, the body can do and, and project like a robot, you know, and this is what I'm trying to get Kelly Nation to understand. I know this is very deep for many, many. I probably lost a lot of, of people who, you know, don't, don't even understand what I'm talking about. But for those who do, those few who do, that's, this video is for you. All right, here we go. Earl and her parents denied she was having sex with the singer. On the same day the news breaks, Kelly performs at the opening ceremonies for the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Now let's go to 2002, where Kelly is indicted in Chicago on child pornography charges stemming from the sex tape. He pleads not guilty and is released on a $750,000 bail. We go to 2003 now, Kelly's arrested in a Florida hotel on additional child pornography charges after investigators said that they found photos of him having sex with a girl. Charges are later dropped after the judge ruled police didn't have a warrant to search uh, his home. 2003, Kelly has an album called Chocolate Factory and is released selling 538,000 copies just in its first week. In September of 2005, his wife asked for an order of protection from her husband, accusing the singer of hitting her when she said she wanted a divorce. In 2006, R. Kelly's brother, Kerry Kelly, says his brother offered him $50,000 in a record deal to say that he was the person in the sex video. In 2007, Kelly released his album, Double Up, which peaks at number one on the Billboard Albums chart. Now we go to 2009, uh, Kelly and his former wife confirmed that they are divorced after 11 years of marriage. Later in that year, Crane's uh, Chicago business reports that a $2.9 million for foreclosure is filed by J.P. Morgan Chase Bank against R. Kelly's suburban mansion. A spokesperson claimed that the singer is not having financial trouble at that time. Now let's go to 2012, where Kelly announced that he is reviving a video series called Trapped in the Closet. The project began as five videos for his dramatic cliffhanger songs in 2007 and eventually grows to several dozen musical chapters dealing with a web of sexual deceit. Kelly teams with IFC to premiere the old and new series and performs the rap opera at events such as a sing-along at Bonnaroo. There was talk of a Broadway show. See, Broadway show. So he was moving even further out there. He was becoming so superficial until they had to do something to bring him back. They had to do something to, you know, minimize the excellence of R. Kelly, if you will. Now, um, I'm going to listen. I think that was all I wanted to let you hear, but I do have another clip of... Um, a defense attorney or a defense uh, reporter talking about the trial and different things like that. Um, and I believe it's New York. I have never had this audio on, so I want to put it on for Kelly Nation um, archive. So let me see what else we have on this and then we'll move right to the next video. Go to 2013, where Kelly's mansion was once valued at more than $5 million, sells for just $950,000 in a foreclosure auction. And this is where things start to really heat up for R. Kelly. BuzzFeed reports on parents' claims that R. Kelly brainwashed their daughters and was keeping them in an abusive cult. One woman said that she was with Kelly willingly. Following the BuzzFeed report, activists launched the, quote, Hashtag mute R. Kelly movement calling her for boycotts of his music. Now we go to 2018 where Kelly is evicted from two Atlanta area homes over more than the $31,000 owed in unpaid rent. Later in that year, Time's Up campaign joins the Mute R. Kelly social media campaign and pushes for further investigation into R. Kelly's behavior. Kelly's camp responds, we will vigorously resist 
and the, this attempted public lynching of a black man who has made extraordinary contributions to our culture. Later in that year, Spotify cuts R. Kelly's music from its playlist, citing its policy on hate content and hateful conduct. Shortly after, uh, Apple and Pandora also stopped promoting his music. Kelly's team pushes back, noting that other artists on Spotify had been accused of con or convicted of crimes. Then in 2019, Lifetime airs the documentary Surviving R. Kelly, which revisited old allegations against him and brought new ones up into the spotlight. The series followed the uh, BBC's R. Kelly Sex, Girls, and Videotapes, released the previous year that the alleged, alleged singer was holding women against their will. Later in 2019, uh, Lady Gaga says she will remove the duet with Kelly from streaming services. Also that year, multiple media outlets reports that Kelly and his label, Sony subsidiary REC Records Park Ways, Kelly continues to deny all the allegations against him. July 11 of 2019, we see Kelly indicted by a federal grand jury in Chicago on charges including child pornography, enticement of a minor, and obstruction of justice. A separate indictment filed in the Eastern District of New York included charges of racketeering, kidnapping, forced labor, and the sexual exploitation of a child. He is arrested in Chicago once again. Later that year, Kelly's denied bail in his New York City sex abuse case after a judge agreed with prosecutors that freeing him from jail would create a risk of him fleeing or tampering with witnesses. Now we go to 2020, where Kelly pleaded not guilty in Chicago to an updated federal indictment that included child pornography charges and allegations involving a new accuser, while prosecutors say more ch charges alleging yet another victim were upcoming. Kelly's manager is arrested in 2020 later that year in California on charges that he threatened a shooting at a Manhattan theater two years ago, forcing an evacuation and the cancellation of the screening of a documentary addressing allegations that the singer had sexually abused women and girls. Later uh, in 2021, a man is sentenced to eight years in prison for setting fire to a, a a car in Florida, what authorities say was an attempt to intimidate a potential witness in the sex trafficking trial. In 22, uh, just uh, this past June, a prosecutor say R. Kelly deserves at least 25 years behind bars for abusing children. And today, with the latest update to this long saga of a timeline for R. Kelly, Kelly is sentenced to 30 years in prison for that New York case. Now okay, coming so up, we're going to stop there because what I want to now add, um, which they didn't add the Chicago trial that was he was found not guilty of six of the 13 counts and he's facing his um, post trial motions as of right now. And then after the post trial, mo trial motions, he's going to his sentencing um, or either possibly a new trial or an acquittal. And then um, supposedly in the news right now, as of December 8th, he 2022, he is supposed to be the father of Joycelyn Savage's baby, uh, baby, I don't know if it's a girl or not, which is not true. It, um, that, that news is false. And um, then uh, before that, a uh, week or two before that, um, his new album drops supposedly and then he is saying from jail he's saying and his um entourage is saying that he had nothing to do with that album drop so somebody is is manifesting his dreams for him now you know he's not saying anything he doesn't have anything to really say when it comes down to trial because anything that he say can and will be used against him the me too movement uh, miss burke she's not saying anything at all and it's amazing how this whole process is is unfolding itself. It's like all of this was supposed to happen because the entire world was supposed to be against Robert Sylvester Kelly or Kelly. But what the world didn't realize was that he was going to have his people who really supported him, who really cared for him and who was watching every move that was being made. And it just doesn't look real. It doesn't look 
like it's true, you know, um, even all the way down to Joyce Lynn Savage saying that she was pregnant um, many, many months ago, you know, well, of course, nine months ago, but even then, I didn't believe it. Uh, they were going to get married and, you know, all this and all that. I believe that the story was just cre recreating itself to make it make sense to society for those who choose to believe the hype. And, um, you know, just like him going on to the Broadway field of, of what he was doing with his music. He was just do working his music. He was doing the master production of his music and that was going to push him into Broadway. And Broadway was where he was going to be um, where his um, music teacher, Miss um, McClinn, where she wanted him to be. So he was finalizing his, his career is what he was doing and moving into the streaming of, you know, online presence, um, controlling his own money, his own royalties, his own name and all of that. And this is where we're looking at that rim state re reality. That rim state reality is very important. Very important. Kelly nation. Yeah. Kelly nation. That's where I want to think. And you know, of course we always have the midpoint in our, our readings and it asks the restlessness could it be causing delusions? When we have insomnia, we can't sleep. Um, we don't know if we're sleepwalking or if we're in that stuck in that realm of unconscious, non-rapid eye movement state. And um, if we're irritable, we need to heal ourselves. We need to heal our, our area of sleeping and where we sleep and how we sleep and who we sleep with because all that energy plays a part in what we do. And we need to ground ourselves by using healing properties such as sage, such as, um, you know, uh, the Christians use the cross as a re reflection that they could, you know, connect to something and come back from a stronger point of view. But I mean, these are the midpoints that we're talking about now. In belief in self card number eight, we're going to look at the NATO reflection. We're going to look at building up of the self and um, we're going to talk about personality glitches and characteristics that people normally don't know about us that eventually they find out about us. They find this out and when they find it out, when they find these things out, it becomes, you know, how are we going to like right now we know that R. Kelly, Robert Sylvester Kelly is in this area of you know situation how is he going to come out from it how is he going to make it through um and so yeah that's that's what i wanted to share tonight i feel that um let me see there was one more video i want to share with you um we got a few more minutes Happy holidays to everyone, Kelly Nation. I hope that this is bringing some type of um, support and to just let you know what's going on with Robert. <laughs> it's not too much to report, but like I said, I want to keep Kelly Nation alive and up to um, be able to share this information with you when it finally does come out. All right, so this is a video that was done from WGN News, the latest on the R. Kelly trial from a veteran um, Chicago Defender reporter, da Danny. So we're going to let you hear this. It's only like a few minutes, six minutes. Here we go. Danielle Sanders has been following the story from the courtroom. She joins us today to tell us more about it now. They rested their case. The defense started, uh, I think, on Thursday. And right off the bat, they're asking for an acquittal. Immediately asked for an acquittal, saying that the prosecution had not done enough to present the evidence uh, in its case. So, a long shot. So, and also, R. Kelly saying that he's not going to take the stand in his own defense. Yeah, yeah. that wasn't very surprising yeah. uh, to me. To me. Uh, he hasn't spoken previously in his previous uh, trial. He didn't take the stand, so I wasn't surprised that he's not doing it this time. What has this been like for you as a reporter in there? I mean, you know, you have to be objective and you have to 
you know, just the facts. But still, just listening to the testimony, listening to those women talk about how he raped them, you know, and all these things. How's that been for you? Extremely disturbing. You know, you're reporting, you have to be uh, unbiased, but you're human. And when you're hearing back-to-back -back stories of abuse and torture and rape, um, and psychological trauma. It's just been very devastating and quite frankly it, it's it's been really gross at times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to listen to some of that testimony. When listening to um, especially the girl who initially did not testify in the 2008 trial to come now in, the in this trial and to testify what do you think her reasoning behind that was for changing her story? Well, I think uh, it may be a number of reasons. Uh, she basically said, I'm tired of holding his secrets, his lies. But you have to remember, she was a 14-year-old girl um, who was under the influence of her family, quite right. frankly, um, who probably had a lot to do with why she didn't testify. She's, she's 34 now. She's a mother. She's a parent. Um, and I really think she's at a place in her life where she's ready to tell her story uh, very bravely. But I can't. I had to remember that at that moment she was a 14-year-old right. girl. And under her parents' influence, as you say, because they were going along with it, and he was paying them, yeah. giving them money, vacations, things like that. So that was what happened. Yeah, she was literally unprotected. Yeah, that, that's a shame. Is the jury, well, can you see the jury? What do you think they're thinking? No, it's hard to say what they're thinking, mm -hmm. but is it influencing them, you think, the testimony? I think there have been some moments where you've seen the jurors kind of lean in uh -huh. uh, and listening to the testimony where they were very engaged. There, There's clearly some members of the jury that were clearly disturbed uh, by some of the testimony. I don't know how you couldn't have somewhat of an emotional reaction to some of the visuals that you saw along with uh, some of the testimony that you heard. So right. I definitely think they're impacted in your from covering trials in your eyes how did the prosecution do do you think that they got their case across I do um, I think there's been discussion because two of the witnesses had immunity you know would it be as effective but the facts are still the facts and you still have a videotape in his testimony and it was still very strong the young the young lady who's now 34 had very strong testimony the following witnesses other uh, um, victims also had very strong and emotional and compelling testimony and held their own even under cross-examination. Now 2008 we know the uh, the trial here he was acquitted in that trial and he has been sentenced to 30 years in the New York case. What difference do you think this trial will do in anything? Um, I think it, it hopefully makes up for what should have happened in 2008 and also sends another message to him about taking responsibility and personal accountability, which is something that still has not happened um, throughout this entire process. You're talking about over 20 years, mm -hmm. two decades right. of uh, abuse and mistreatment of these women. So I still think it's very, um, very necessary um, and still very much more important for those victims, for those young women to get justice and to have it on record that their abuse and the things that they suffered, will he'll be held accountable for that. Do you talk to people in the community about this case and what are their responses? Also, people still listen to R. Kelly music. Yeah, yeah. It's been a very polarizing discussion and I have people on both sides that still listen to his music um, and others who refuse. And for me, my job has been communicating some of the things that I've been hearing. And I don't think the public, you know, you hear about the tape, you hear about the testimony, but it's something about being there and seeing those images. They're very graphic. They're very disturbing. And I don't think anybody who, who knew the, the detail, the graphic detail um, of that abuse, I don't know how you can listen to his music after that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a 14-year-old girl, very right. clear 14-year-old girl in that in that tape. And people say, oh, she was 16, or she was well-developed, or all these other excuses. And 
It's not. It's a 14-year-old girl, and you were witnessing a rape. We think that documentary probably brought this all to light. Absolutely. Are the supporters still behind him? Do you see people coming out there to the actual um, courthouse? No, that has been one of the very... Because um, the other 28 trial was crazy. It was like a circus. It was a circus. There were protesters uh, and supporters mm -hmm. on both sides. It has been very much the opposite this go-round. I have not seen one supporter mm -hmm. um, outside the courthouse. It's much more subdued. Dude. And I wonder if that is indicative of where we are when it comes to R. Kelly and what we think about him. His star is very, his star is different than yeah. it was in 2008. And, and he looks different, too. Mm -hmm. Tell me how he looks, because we've seen sketches. Mm -hmm. We have reporters, WGM reporters yeah. out there as well, but he's changed a bit, hasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. Very solemn, head down a lot, not making eye contact um, with some of the witnesses. At some point, there were some witnesses who were looking directly at him mm. um, at he doesn't moments. look at them? No, would not look at them. So you definitely, that cockiness, that um, confidence uh, is just not there. Yeah. It's not there. Right. Danielle Spencer, thank you so much for joining us, giving us an insight on this. We'll bring you back after the defense. So I wanted to uh, stop there. I want to look at some of the comments. There's hundreds of them. But uh, three months ago, Danny got on and said people choose to listen to his music because it's damn good and there's actual fans who can separate the art from the artist you know and that's true um me personally I'm gonna hold all of my opinions and my 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 thoughts because um again I'm an observer and you know Danielle her name is uh let me see it's uh on WGN, um, mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah, Danielle Saunders has been following the R. Kelly story for years. She's covering his latest trial in Chicago, um, and this was three months ago, well, September 3rd. Um, mm. But, I mean, I just really feel that the comments are going to say a lot. Someone said three months ago, why is so much hate for men in Western country like that? I pray that these ladies will have their son go through this horrible situation so they will know how it feels to do R. Kelly like that. What are your thoughts? Another person said it, it wasn't a 14-year-old girl. It was Lisa Van Allen and his wife. Um... And then there's a back and forth. Now, according to court transcripts, of course, his wife supposedly is on the video with uh, Jane. Um, but that was the transcripts. Someone asked, who the hell are you to judge? He's not brought on this earth to please you. And then someone says, well, the jury judged him criminally deprived in New York, and that judge punished him with four, with 30 years up to this jury to determine if there would be more years added. And that's why I believe um, that Kim Fox and all of the Chicago connection and all of this, and now the new, you know, Lifetime final, final grand finale is coming up because of the fact that they want to you know, clear the story up. They want the story cleared up so society will know, you know, what they wanted them to know about R. Kelly. And so that's what it is. It's, it's you know, the appeal, again, is where I'm at. And I'm not losing focus and track on that no matter how long it takes to really and truly deal with the appeal process because this is a very long, lengthy um, situation in the court system, especially when you're already a fish caught up in the net. They're not trying to hurry up to figure anything out. So I pray that Robert is okay for this holiday season. I know this is his time. This is his time of year almost his birthday but I mean 
we just got to keep the faith Kelly Nation and I hope that this video I, I did this for documentary purposes to go back and re-listen to how horrific everything sounded as it was going down like a storybook but it wasn't being told by the person it was being told by others so I can't wait to hear Robert Sylvester Kelly's story when it is his time because you know all he could do was put his head down and I know being put in shackles and being you know looked at from a perspective that you never would have thought you would be is very degrading and so he probably has that mentality of the slave mentality because that's what the whole incarceration system is to do to break you down to bring you down um to prevent you from looking at life from the egoic standpoint um that egoic standpoint um also carries over into the non um rapid eye movement state too which is all about the unconsciousness so if you go in with the ego as you are all that you're going to come out in the ego that you're all that but um sometimes to humble ourselves and be in that position where we really know what's going on in the physical realm that is what's going to make us great in the end so there is going to be a final grand finale and it's not the way that society wants it to be it's the way that robert sylvester kelly is going to formulate his story to be what it is so i thank you for liking commenting sharing and subscribing to this podcast for those who you know found this helpful please click the like button please subscribe to this premiere um and yeah thank you so much for being here um i will possibly be back on on tuesday so i thank you so much and um you have a great holiday and um, yeah, I'll probably be back on soon. Peace and blessings. And we'll see you next time.